I want to share with you now some of the programs that we developed to help children with low self-esteem and low academic achievement. But I want you to know that there's a difference in treatment for a child who has high academic achievement and low self-esteem. I think for that child, the way he thinks about himself, no matter how good he does, it isn't good enough. Regardless of causation of that, the treatment is going to be different. The result is if you don't treat, that child at some point may just give up or even worse, have self-destructive behavior. Now when we were doing our testing in the very beginning, we're identifying children who had low self-esteem in a subscale like reading or math or spelling or writing. And teachers would come to me and say, Bill, what do we do? How do we help that child? And there was nothing in the literature. I would say, I believe you as being a good, loving, caring person, which I truly believe. Teachers are some of the best people we have because they go into teaching for the best of all possible reasons, to make a difference in the life of a student. And I would tell them, if you'll use your expertise to help a child identify on any of the low, any of these subscale factors, reading, math, writing, spelling, I'll come back, we'll post-test to see if what you did worked. And sure enough, teachers are able to help children. Knowing this, when we did our final validation study in a lot of different school districts with about 10,000 students, I made the same deal with the teachers. I prepared a packet for every teacher. And I said, if you'll write down what you do to help the child in a subscale factor in reading or math or spelling or writing, then I'll come back, we'll post-test, control for any regression factor, and see if what you did worked, knowing that I believe teachers could help those students. And sure enough, teachers were able to help the students, and what we did then was to group all those things that were common together, do statistical analysis, and we wrote this book, Creating Positive Affective Experiences in the Classroom. Creating those experiences that make children feel good. This was way back in 1978. But McGraw-Hill wanted more prescriptive inter intervention programs for kids that have low self-esteem and low academic achievement. So the first one I built was called Happy Time Program. It was a two-year program. And basically the idea is to bring the positive experiences that children have, because even with a child with low self-esteem, he's had positive experiences is to bring those experiences back into consciousness, be able to hold them there as long as possible, have, him have the feeling and, and provide an interpretive structure for him, like you are good at reading or math or spelling, and that good feeling. And hopefully that experience becomes integrated into a self-structure so the next time he thinks about himself in a particular area, these experiences will come forward into consciousness. And we also had a way of dealing with negative experiences. We developed lessons that would try to get those experiences recognized and, and a catharsis, a, a release of the energy that's bound up in that experience. I don't know about you, but for me, I get a lot of positive experience. But if I get a negative experience, for some reason, I just hold on to it. I won't let it go. And so what we wanted to do also is to take those negative experiences that a child has, bring them back into consciousness, and have them released, and or have them diffused. And what we would do is, or have a catharsis, where the child would scribble out a page with the idea of releasing that energy. It's almost like releasing an energy from a repression. And then provide a different interpretive structure of you are capable of anything. And we also developed another program. It was called Finding Myself in School. It's under the belief that people tend to do those things that they feel are relevant and important for them and their success. We cannot let children deinvest. We can't let children think that reading or writing or spelling or whatever is not important where they don't care because they're absolutely critical skills that people have to have. So we had a series of testimonies. We wrote 12 booklets, and each testimony told about the difficulty they had as a student, as an elementary school student. 
and how they overcame that difficulty and later went on to be successful, providing a model for the student who's struggling in school. Between the teacher creating positive experiences, the happy time program, and finding myself in school, children were doing better. The problem was, and in those days it's an example, we had a 30 word spelling test at the end of the week. And a child who's totally de-invested, he doesn't care, it doesn't make any difference to him, he just has to attend school. He's getting 13, 14, 15, correct. Getting a failing grade. Now you've got your prescriptive programs working. And now he's trying harder. He's doing 16, 18, 19, 20, correct. What kind of grades he going to get? He's still going to get a failing grade. He just comes to the point and says, you know, hey, what's the use of this? I'm trying, I'm still failing. So what we did is to develop a system and take him out of that traditional grading system, define a baseline of performance, and say his baseline was 14 words. So we're going to recognize everything above 14 words. We're going to recognize everything he does above 14 words and validate that effort. Create good, positive experiences for the effort he puts forward. And over time, that student will slowly but steadily increase his effort, increase his, the student will increase his energy in terms of working to learn and ultimately become successful. This has been the foundation of the program that we have developed now. All of these components have been integrated into the Kirkwood program that's online.